Mm -hmm. Oh, hi! You caught me witnessing half of my collection vanishing. Speaking of hard-to-find comics, let's take a look at some of the more rare G.I. Joe comics this week. Hello! Welcome to Comic Tropes! I'm your host, Chris. Every year at this time, the G.I. Joe fan community comes together for an event called Cobra Convergence. Now, since I review comic books instead of toys, it can actually be kind of tricky to get that Cobra quotient up where it should be. So this year, I've invited a very special guest. Please welcome Mr. Cobra Commander. Coco, how are you? Don't call me that, Mr. Tropes. You know, we're not so different, you and I. Uh, how do you figure? You try to take over the world with, I don't know, weather dominators. We've both been used car salesmen and have thousands of followers. And we're both dressed casually today. He's not wrong. So, with that in mind, let's take a look at a comic book from the UK which featured a villainous spin-off of the organization Cobra. The G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero toy line was launched by Hasbro in 1982, and Marvel Comics worked closely with them to create character names and profiles for the figures, as well as pushing for toy maker Hasbro to add a villain. Writer Larry Hama had been developing a spin-off idea for S.H.I.E.L.D., which would feature an international squad of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents going after enemies like HYDRA. It was an easy swap to use this concept for G.I. Joe. The comic launched in the summer of 1982. Three years later, Hasbro's action figures were imported to Europe as Action Force, and an Action Force comic launched in 1987. It was a weekly that would include a reprint of half of an American issue and two short original stories. The one we're looking at today is issue 17. The story focuses primarily on Quick Kick, who didn't factor into too many G.I. Joe comics, so using him was less of a risk of contradicting the American reprints. Quick Kick had infiltrated a spin-off terrorist organization from Cobra known as the Two-Headed Serpent. As the final issue begins, Cobra has begun an assault on the sect and its leader, Michael Anke, who is trying to escape in a Fang helicopter. His childhood friend Quick Kick knew that he would try this and is waiting to confront him. After a brief martial arts battle, Michael ends up falling off of his castle's rooftop to his death. Flint shows up and tells Quick Kick that Cobra fled when they saw Action Force arrive. Quick Kick walks away sullenly, sad that he wasn't able to save his friend, and probably also very sad that Action Force didn't let him wear boots or a jacket in the snowy mountains. So what do you think of the two-headed serpent, Coco? Mediocre at best. Their leader has no sense of style. His shirt looks like the sexy statues from the never-ending story, not two snakes. The never-ending story statues? Oh, he's not wrong. One last interesting piece of info about this comic is the final story in the issue, which was written by a young Grant Morrison, who would go on to become a superstar writer on books like Justice League of America and X-Men. This story features Quick Kick meditating before he plans to punch through six inches of oak. He thinks about the other martial artists he's met, which are all Marvel Comics characters, Iron Fist, Batroc, and Elektra. Not sure Batroc necessarily deserves to be in that company, but so be it. From there, Quick Kick thinks about the best martial artist he ever met, Shang-Chi. The story essentially just recaps Shang-Chi's origin. It introduces a Marvel Comics character to a potential new audience, but it's unique because the G.I. Joe comics never crossed over with other Marvel superheroes, and the title implied that it was 100% in its own continuity, minus a few crossovers with Transformers. Speaking of Quick Kick, let's talk about an unpublished issue of the Marvel G.I. Joe comic that featured Quick Kick. It was issue 61, and it also featured, alongside Quick Kick, the G.I. Joe's Stalker, Outback, and Snowjob getting kidnapped by Russians. Now, Coco, how do you feel about the Russians? I hate them. I'm surprised to hear that. What makes you say that? They're communists. That means they share. I hate sharing. 
Fair enough. So, without any further ado, let's take a look at this issue, which was actually illustrated by superstar artist Todd McFarlane, and find out why Marvel decided never to publish it. Todd McFarlane broke into comics in 1985, doing various specials and fill-in issues with Marvel and DC. In 1987, he drew some issues of The Incredible Hulk that really got him noticed, and he was also hired to illustrate issues 60 and 61 of G.I. Joe. After that, he went on to illustrate The Amazing Spider-Man and became a superstar. But that was a year in the future. At this point, G.I. Joe was selling great for Marvel and had been the most subscribed to title from Marvel in 1985. It received the most fan mail of any title in 1987. So Larry Hama, the writer, had a lot of say in how the title went. Hama apparently did not care for McFarlane's work in issue 60, but he deemed issue 61 so poor that Marvel decided to hire a fill-in artist, Marshall Rogers, to completely redraw the entire issue. Rogers was towards the tail end of his career, and while he was never a superstar, he had a successful career throughout the 70s and 80s at Marvel and DC, including the classic Batman story, The Laughing Fish, from 1978. As a kid, I loved Todd McFarlane's artwork, but in 1987, he was really still starting out and he became a superstar more in the early 90s, like when he launched Image Comics with some friends in 1991, including his own creator-owned book, Spawn. So in 1995, Marvel wanted to cash in on that popularity. They realized that they had this completely illustrated G.I. Joe comic that Todd McFarlane did and had never seen the light of day. It's going to give us a unique opportunity to see how two completely different artists interpreted the exact same script. What do you think of that, Coco? Let's just see who's better and make fun of the other one. No, we're not going to do that. Can't you just keep yourself busy building, I don't know, a shrink ray? The splash page opening by McFarlane shows the G.I. Joe team being briefed by Hawk and looking at a slideshow. This was ages before PowerPoint. McFarlane certainly sets an interesting scene with lots of detail. It looks like a boiler room. But the slideshow of the target they're going for in the Eastern Block looks more like someone walking around the corner. Rogers certainly has less overall detail, but his view is in closer and shows us the main characters up close so that we can get to know them and the slide looks like a projected slide. The next several pages involve a subplot with Cobra Commander in his new battle suit, deciding to retire from Cobra so that he can reconnect with his son, Billy. Billy rejects him, kicks a Crimson Guard named Fred Seven, and also the lame Raptor. Billy leaves. McFarlane keeps the action and reactions extreme, but he also has panels with little or no background or generic sci-fi walls. Rogers' action is less in-your-face, but very clear. A lot of medium-distance shots to let the scene play out, but not as many close-ups to show the emotion. His backgrounds are much more detailed, though, and look like a normal garage. How'd that retirement go, Coco? It wasn't my favorite time. My son abandoned me, but at least he never betrayed me, and I killed Fred and Raptor. Well, that got dark. Let's uh, just go back to the comic book. Halfway through the issue, Billy attempts to connect with a ninja master he once met and is introduced to his assistant, Jinx. In McFarlane's pages, she's hovering upside down in the rafters and drops down, illustrated with a very happy and youthful face, as well as long hair. The most noticeable panel is the upper right one, where Billy is surprised to find a ninja above. Meanwhile, Rogers illustrated Jinx hanging from her legs in the rafters and added a lot more moody lighting techniques. The largest panel is the final one featuring Billy actually meeting Jinx face to face. It's worth noting Jinx has her short spiky hair, which is how she was always depicted in the comics and cartoon. Moving forward, Cobra Commander decides to quit Cobra and try to connect with his son. In Rogers' page, the biggest panel is Cobra Commander leaving and Fred getting angry about feeling abandoned and not promoted. He shoots Cobra Commander in the back, and the panels move to a skewed perspective, showing that things are not normal. He picks up the battle armor helmet he designed with plans to take over Cobra. In McFarlane's pages, he combines the actions of Cobra Commander leaving and Fred getting his gun so that every panel has a bit more space. 
The shooting of Cobra Commander is a bit more dramatic, and the other two panels are similar, but Fred does hold the helmet awkwardly. I think it's interesting to see McFarlane's take, and he was a bit more raw, but energetic. I would argue he's attempting to imitate the artwork of Michael Golden, who was the original artist on Marvel's book The Nam. That started in 1986, and Larry Hama edited it. He really liked Golden's work, so it's interesting that he wasn't into McFarlane's interpretation of this issue. The issue ends with the Joe team ambushed and overwhelmed. McFarlane moves a panel from the previous page into his so that we can have the Joes shooting in the biggest panel. But the next one, where the layout of the enemy's tanks blocking their pickup truck and them in an alley, is pretty distant. Rogers' is, is closer, and I'd argue his detail on the truck is better. The final page, showing the tanks, is pretty fantastic and realistic, whereas McFarlane's tank is bloopier. Rogers' faces aren't as expressive, but McFarlane's are drawn further away, so neither engage us as much as they could have. The final pages feature the Joes' Eastern Bloc contact attempting to ram the tanks with his pickup and being blown up. McFarlane's isn't bad, but Rogers really excels here by having the explosion, the most dramatic moment of the issue, take up nearly the entire page. After that, Outback is ordered by Stalker to escape through the tunnels to get their intel back to G.I. Joe while the rest of the team are captured due to injuries. McFarlane puts Outback in a really deep tunnel and some blood drips on him, but it's a little confusing whether it's liquid dropping on him or a background detail. Rogers has Outback huddled in a tiny drain with just the manhole separating him from the enemy inches away. So what do you think, Coco? Do you prefer one artist's version over the other? I don't have any use for art. I outsource that to Dr. Mindbender or Zatan. Okay, thanks so much for contributing. With that said, let's take a look at one final comic book, The Origins of the Russian Counterpart to G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe was a real American hero, so it was only logical during the years of the Cold War that there would be a Russian counterpart. They were known as October Guard and showed up in the sixth issue of the comic, but their origins go back further. In April of 1982, Marvel published Bizarre Adventures No. 31. It was a black and white comic magazine that let creators introduce new stories that they retained the rights to. Writer Tom DeFalco and artist Herb Trimpey created a five-page story called Pravda Patrol. It was about an elite unit run by Captain Yuri with teammates Sachi, Big Bear, Stryker, and the Mouse. In that first story, the unit was tasked with keeping a pathway through an Afghanistan village clear for the coming Soviet tanks while being attacked by the Mujahideen. They are ultimately successful. Cut to the launch of G.I. Joe by Marvel, and the editors hired Tom DeFalco and Herb Trimpey to create a two-issue fill-in, originally scheduled to be issues three and four. But DeFalco and Trimpey decided to include their characters, Pravda Patrol. The original art shows the Pravda Patrol with the same team as appeared in their story from Bizarre Adventures. The indicia indicates that those characters are owned by DeFalco and Trimpey. But when the issue was submitted to Hasbro for approval, they got a big no on including characters that Hasbro did not own. So the issue was redrawn and relettered. You can see when compared that the new names barely fit in the existing word balloons. All of the characters' names and looks were changed. Captain Yuri became Colonel Breckow. Big Bear became Horror Show. Mouse became Storm Mavic, Stryker became Shrage, and Sachi became Dana. And so, the October Guard went on to have some action figures made of them, they appeared in future issues of the comic book, they appeared on the G.I. Joe cartoon, they appear on t-shirts. Any thoughts on all of that, Coco? Only that you've now fallen into my trap! I've secretly been broadcasting DNA hypno-waves, which will soon transform your viewers into snake men! Then you should meet our next guest, Snake Eyes! What? Retreat! Retreat! Okay, so Cobra Commander just fell off a cliff? Uh, with that said, let's take a quick look at the fan art that came in this week, and then we'll be back with some of my final thoughts on this issue.
Emmanuel Cabrera from the Bronx sent in this artwork riffing on a scene from The Immortal Hulk, which reveals I'm secretly running Infotron from inside. Based off of my recent video about Mad Magazine, Grimlock sent in this piece featuring two of me as the black and white spies. Bat Fink illustrated a cartoon of me in the style of Robert Crumb's Keep On Trucking art. You can find more of Bat Fink's artwork on his Instagram page. Finally, Casey Chapman created an impressive piece featuring me in Spider-Man's black costume. Love it. If you would like to have some fan art featured on this channel, I'm happy to do that. Just make sure it has something to do with Comic Tropes specifically, and then you can send it into this email, comictropes at gmail.com. I'm happy to feature it. And I know I said I was going to take a break, but a very kind viewer, Jarrell, sent in a bunch of Gachapon prizes. They're all based on Hellboy. But this will get me through until I go over to Japan to get you all some new ones. So thank you to Jarrell. That was a very kind donation. There were four entrants this week, so I am going to choose one of the fan art submissions to win a Gachapon prize that comes out of the Gacha Pony machine that was donated to us by Lunar Shine Source. So I've got four numbers here, dropping them in the bag, shaking it up, and the winner is number two. Two, that's Grimlock. Well, Grimlock has already won now that I think of it. Okay, gotta draw again. All right, number four, I believe that's Casey. So Casey, yep, I'm looking at the script. Casey, you have won a Gachapon. Let's take a look at which one you won. And then I got some thoughts on G.I. Joe. All right. So looking at this, it looks like that might be, um, I don't remember the name of it, but it was like the Nazi villain in the first Hellboy movie. Oh, Cronin maybe? It's kind of hard to see, I guess, from uh, the camera. But anyway, I will send that your way. So uh, anyway, um, regarding the issues that I reviewed, I loved G.I. Joe growing up, huge fan. It's really fun to look for some of the issues that are a little more hard to find. Uh, I definitely enjoyed Action Force. Now, Action Force Weekly is a little harder to find, and part of that, the reason for that, is it was definitely created to be very disposable. This is very flimsy material compared to your average comic book. Very flimsy. Um, that said, even though it takes place in another continuity, it often featured up-and-coming uh, artists and writers. So you can find a lot of uh, young talent in Action Force, and that's really cool to see that. Plus, it's just, you know, extra stories that you may not have come across from the real American hero era. Now, they're called Action Force. They're, they're based out of, you know, Europe instead. That said, it all is designed to more or less fit in between the Marvel G.I. Joe series that was primarily written by Larry Hama. Just something I'd recommend uh, taking a look for. All right, if you enjoyed this content, if you're a fan of G.I. Joe, there is a lot more content that you can find during Cobra Convergence 4. I kind of got that out. Cobra Convergence 4. Uh, first, today, there is a video by Hooded Cobra Commander 788. I definitely recommend you check that out. And from there, from his channel, you can find a lot more contributors. So definitely recommend that you check that out. I sincerely appreciate you watching this video. Uh, if you're new to the channel, welcome. I cover a little bit of everything. Uh, old, new, indie, mainstream, foreign, domestic, I cover it all. And usually I do more of a deep dive into either the history of comics or maybe a technique of a certain creator. So that's the angle that I use. Uh, thank you so much for checking us out. And uh, until next time, oh yeah, I do have a catchphrase. Keep reading comics. I'm running away from home. My parents are mean. Where will you go? Oh, I'm not sure, but I'll show them. Have you considered joining Cobra? Cobra Commander? Join me and you can become a disposable hedge, I mean an elite trooper, with plans to take over the world through weather dominators. 